I want, please help me welcome Christine. Who Thank you so much for coming. So God said to Gwydion, Take the mosses and the stones of the earth, and from them fashion a great army of trees. Troi iaith ac elfydd, rithwch riedaw gwydd, gantaw yn llyth. idea of England to them. It was a kind of far-off, imagined homeland, a place of green and fairies. And every Christmas, they gave each other Christmas cards with snow on, even though they'd never seen snow and had no idea what it was. Well, when my dad was 10 years old, his father, my grandfather, decided to move the family to England. So they got on a great ship and they spent six weeks ducking and rolling on that ship. And when they crossed the equator, they threw prayers over the side to Poseidon. And when they pulled into England, they were so shocked to find that England was in fact cold, miserable, grey and damp. <laughs> so they got into the car and my grandfather drove them to the house that he'd bought for the family. Now that was in Seven Oaks in Kent. And they drove past the seven great oak trees that gave that town its name. And then they pulled into a little winding tree tunnel, a little lane with trees reaching up and covering on each side. And then they pulled into the driveway of the house and it seemed like it was a mansion to them. Four stories tall it was, and each of those stories was tall with lofty ceilings. And it had a garden. And standing in that garden was a beech tree. It grew a little way away from the house. And so it had been able to grow into the perfect beech shape it had a trunk tall and straight and a head that was perfectly domed and boughs that swept up and out and down and moved in little circles in the wind. So that if you stepped under those boughs, you entered a cool green circle of mossy shade. And the boys played in that tree. They climbed into its branches and they became different things on different days. A motorbike, a racehorse. A king's throne. Well, time passed and my dad grew up and he met my mum. 
and they settled in a town in West Wales, a town called Carmarthen, Caer Marthen, the Fort of Merlin. And this is where the story jumps back. 1,500 years, because 1,500 years ago, there was a king on the throne in Britain, and his name was Vortigern, and he was a weak king. The Saxons were invading his land, and he was scared. So he called his advisors, and he asked them what he should do, and they sat in a cold stone tower room with spiders spinning their webs across the corners, and the advisors consulted their runes and oracles, and they told him if he should build a tower on a certain hilltop in North Wales, then he would be safe. Never mind about his people, but he at least would be safe from the invading people. And so the king gathered the finest builders in the land and he packed up his entire court and they moved to North Wales to this hilltop. And when they arrived, the builders started to dig to lay the foundations. And they worked hard all that day. And at the end of that day, they went to bed and they slept. And when they got up the next morning, there was nothing to show for all the work they'd done the day before. It had all just crumbled back into the earth. Well, there was nothing for them to do except start again. So they started again, and this time they worked twice as hard. They built the walls twice as high. And they went to bed, and they slept. And when they got up the next morning, Again, there was nothing left to show for the work they'd done. And so it was every day. And so Vortigern summoned his advisors again, and they met, and the advisors consulted the stars, they consulted their books, they consulted their runes, and they said, if you find a boy without a father, he will help you. And so the king sent his messengers across the land. They went to every town and they pulled up on their horses and blew on their trumpets and called out, By order of the king! Does anybody know of a boy without a father? And when they came to that small town in West Wales, that town that would later become Carmarthen, there were some boys playing outside the town gate. And one of them said, Yeah, Merlin, he hasn't got a father. You'll find him in the old oak tree. Because in the centre of that town there was an oak tree. It was a young oak tree back then. And the boy Merlin loved that tree. He spent all his time climbing into its branches and he would sit there and whisper his secrets to that tree. And the tree whispered back and they say that's where he got his knowledge. When the king's men to take Merlin came to take Merlin away, Merlin was sad. He was sad to leave the tree, to leave his mother, to leave his home. And so he put a curse on that tree. And that curse has been remembered through the generations by the people of that town till today. In the form of a rhyme. If Merlin's oak should tumble down, then shall fall Carmarthen town. Well, time passed and still the oak tree stood there until the 1950s when there was a little square around the tree and the tree was the centre of all the gossip for the town. Lovers met under it and children played under it. It was the proper meeting place that anything would happen. But there was a man that lived near that oak tree and he was old, and he had no friends or family. And when he heard the lovers whispering sweet nothings into each other's ears, when he heard the laughter of the children, he got more and more bitter, until one night he waited until everybody else was in bed. He went out and he poured poison over the roots of the tree. The tree took a long time to die, but it died in the end. Over the next 20 years, it became twisted and blackened, just a stump. And the people tried to protect it, they put railings around it, but it was no good. And by 1976, the council 
concreted over it and built a roundabout on top of it. And today, the only piece left of that tree is in the town museum in Carmarthen. <coughs> Ten years after that, my mum was pregnant with my sister. 1987. And they were watching the weather forecast, and the man that read the weather forecast that night, his name was Michael Fish. And he's become famous for what he said that night, unfortunately for him. He said, now you might have heard that there's a hurricane on the way. Well, don't worry, there isn't. It's going to be a nice, calm, peaceful night. And just then, my mum's birth pains began. And so my parents stepped out to get into the car. My grandmother had come down to help with the birth. And they put everything they needed into the little car. And by the time they got into that car, there were leaden raindrops falling from a black sky. By the time the little car pulled out onto the road, the windscreen was awash with water and the wipers swished uselessly. It's 30 miles from my parents' house to Carmarthen. And back then, it was 30 miles of narrow, winding lanes. And that little car, every time it got to the bottom of a valley, the floods were deepening. And every time it got to the top of a hill, it was buffeted by strong side winds. And the trees were starting to lash against the side of the car and bend in the wind. You can imagine my dad hunched over the steering wheel, barely able to see a foot in front of the car. And beside him, my mum's contractions increasing. In 
loved by Laura Riding after worshipping her as a goddess for 12 years. Laura had disappeared into a locked room with the American poet Shulia Jackson. And she'd emerged 12 hours later, triumphant, to dump Robert. So Robert retreated to Devon in the southwest of England to pass the war. And he lived in a little village called Gampton, which is very close to where I lived when I was making this piece. He lived in a little house with his friends. And he had an office up under the roof. And he sat in that office and he was working on his historical novel, The Golden Fleece. In that book, Robert describes a scene where a young boy stumbles ashore on the island of Mallorca. He's the last surviving Argonaut. And he has a message for the priestess of the sacred orange grove at Deya. So the boy makes his way there and he delivers his message. He tells her how the Greek-speaking people on the mainland have abandoned the triple moon goddess, the goddess whom the priestess serves, in favour of their own male god, Apollo. They've desecrated the shrines of the goddess and put statues of Apollo in their place. <coughs> the priestess is shocked. Now this story is something that Robert Graves believed to be historical fact. He's just developing his theories about the white goddess and her cult. And the connection between her and divine inspiration. Since the age of 15, poetry has been my ruling passion. And I have never intentionally undertaken any task or formed any relationship that seemed inconsistent with poetic principles. And this has sometimes won me the reputation of an eccentric. I tend to judge poets by their faithfulness to the single poetic theme of life and death. Perfect faithfulness to the theme affects the reader of a poem with a strange feeling between delight and horror, of which the purely physical effect is that the hair literally stands on end. A. E. Houseman's test of a true poem was simple and practical. He asked, does it make the hair of one's chin bristle if one repeats it silently while shaving? but he didn't explain why the hair should bristle. The theme, briefly, is the antique story of the birth, life, death, and resurrection of the god of the waxing year. The central chapters concern the god's losing battle with the god of the waning year, the love of the capricious and all-powerful threefold goddess, their mother, bride, and their out. All true poetry, that is, true by husband's practical test, celebrates some incident or scene in this very ancient story. The reason why the hairs turn on end, the skin crawls, and the shiver runs down the spine when one writes or reads a true poem, is that a true poem is necessarily an invocation of the white goddess, or the muse, the mother of all living, the ancient power of fright and lust, the female spider, or the queen bee, who embraces death. In 1941, Robert Graves began corresponding with the Welsh poet Alan Lewis about his ideas, his ideas about true poetry and their connection to the white goddess. And Alan Lewis told him a name, the name of Taliesin. So Robert Graves did some research and he found the story. <laughs> Thank you. 
him. Sorry, his name was Morvran. People called him Avagdi, which means utter darkness, because he was so ugly. He was so ugly that when he walked down the street, small children ran screaming to their mothers. When he walked through the fields, birds screeched and turned the other way. When he walked through the forest, flowers curled up and died. Now, Kerry Dwen was worried about her son. She was a good mother. She was worried about his future. So she thought, what can I do to help my son? She pulled down her books, great leather-bound books they were, and she brushed the dust off and turned the pages, and they were thick like skin, looking for a spell, something that would help him. And then she found it. A spell for divine inspiration. And knowledge. She thought if I can give my son that, at least people will respect him. But it was a difficult spell. It involved collecting thousands of different leaves and herbs and barks and flowers and buds and roots and each one of these had to be collected at a precisely given hour on a precise day of a precise month in the year. And on top of that, a cauldron had to be kept boiling for a year and a day, and each one of those leaves, buds, flowers, roots, sparks, had to be added to the cauldron at the precise, correct time, on the precise day of the year. Well, if Carrie Dren was going to be out on the hillsides collecting all these plants, she'd need someone to keep the fire burning for her, and so she went out into the village, and there she saw little Guion Bach. Now, Guion was not particularly bright or clever, but he didn't have anything better to do. And so Kerry Dwen grabbed him by the ear and dragged him in. And she said, now look here, make sure you keep that fire burning and don't let it go out or there'll be trouble. So Guion sat there, tying the sticks into bundles, throwing them into the fire for a year and a day. And Kerry Dwen, she was out there in the hot sun, she was there, scratching into the bark of a tree. In the winter, in the snow, she was there, trying to dig into the ground to get a bit of a root. And so the year passed. And when the time was up, when the spell was ready, Kerry Dren took her son, Morfran. She put him near the cauldron, ready to receive its gift. And then she sat down against the wall. She'd barely slept that year. She'd been out all days in all weathers, day and night, collecting the herbs that she needed. And so, just for a moment, she closed her eyes. Well, Guion saw his chance. A year's frustration welled up inside him. He pushed Morvran out the way. He stood where Morvran had stood, and just then, something started to happen in the cauldron started to bubble. The mixture started to thicken and darken. And then suddenly the cauldron cracked into three pieces and made a dreadful scream. And the black liquid flowed out across the land and everywhere it flowed was scorched. And at the same moment when the cauldron cracked, three golden drops flew up into the air and hung there, glittering. And then they fell onto Guion's hand and they were hot. They burned him, so he put his hand to his mouth. And in that moment, Guion knew everything. He knew what it was to be the brightness of stars, to be a sword in a hand, to be a droplet in the air. But more than any of that, he knew that Kerry Dren was going to be mad, so he ran. <laughs> he ran out that door. And he couldn't run fast enough. He couldn't get away fast enough, but he knew what it was to be a hare. He felt his ears lengthening and flattening. He felt fur growing from his paws, his stride lengthening, and he was a hare. And then Kerry Dren was waking up. She knew what had happened. 
And she was after him and she became a greyhound. She was faster than he was. And just when she was nipping at his tail, Gwion came to a river. He jumped in and his fur became scales and he was a silver, glittering salmon, jumping and leaping up the stream. But Kerry Dwen was after him and she was an otter. Teeth and claws. She was using her powerful tail to beat her way after him and snapping at his tail. And just when it seemed she was about to bite into him, Gwion leapt into the air. And his scales became feathers, his fins became wings, and he flew up and up and up and up as a bird. And Kerry Dwen, she leapt out of the river too, and she became a hawk. And with her powerful wing beats and with her talons outstretched, she was just about to grasp Gwion when Gwion saw far below him a farmyard. And in that farmyard was a pile of winnowed wheat, and so Gwion dropped like a stone. And when he hit that pile of wheat, he became a grain of wheat. Kerry Dwen floated gently down and settled in the farmyard as a little brown speckled hen. <laughs> and she started to peck. And she pecked. And she pecked. And she pecked, and she pecked, and she pecked, until the whole pile of wheat was gone. And then she turned back into her human form. And she felt a bit sick. <laughs> but she felt pleased with herself. And she went home. Only that feeling of sickness didn't go away. And Kerry Dwen's belly started to swell. And after nine months, she gave birth to a beautiful baby boy. Now Kerry Dwen knew that it was Gwion, but because she was a good mother, she couldn't bring herself to harm him, and so she laid him in a basket. She wrapped the basket in canvas and painted it with tar, and she took it down to the beach. And then she waded out into the sea, she put the basket down on the water and she pushed it off. She stood there with her skirts floating around her and watched until the basket was just a tiny dot on the horizon. Well, as Kerry Dwen gave birth to that baby, so my mother gave birth to my sister. They made it to the hospital in time. And my sister was born about three o'clock in the morning. And my dad turned round to make the drive home. Now that was more difficult than the drive there because now, by now the floods were deeper and the trees had started to fall in the roads. But my dad chose his roads well, and he made it home okay, and he went to bed. When he got up the next morning, he put on the little black and white TV that we had then, and he saw scenes of destruction across the country. Swathes of woodland flattened like matchsticks, caravans flipped like toys, roofs torn off, eight people dead. Britain lost 18 million trees that night. And the whole landscape of the country and people's relationship with trees was changed forever. And the newsreader said, Seven Oaks in Kent lost six of the seven oak trees that gave the town its name. And so my dad thought of his dad back in Seven Oaks, and he picked up the phone and rang him. And my grandfather, his father, answered the phone in tears. Now my grandfather was a hard man, a stern disciplinarian. He didn't cry very often. It was the beech tree. The beech tree that had been the symbol of green England for them, the beech tree had fallen. 
After that, my dad rang the hospital. But the line was dead. So he rang the telephone exchange. And they told him that, the telephone company told him that the Carmarthen exchange was flooded, along with much of the town of Carmarthen. The hospital was cut off for three days. Nurses had to be carried into work on the backs of lorries because they were the only things that could get through the floods. When Merlin's oak shall tumble down, then shall fall Carmarthen town. A little further down the coast, there lived a boy called Elfin, and Elfin was down on his luck because he'd spent all his money and all his father's money, and his father was not very happy about this. And so he was about to cut Elfin off without so much as a penny to his name, and Elfin came before his father and he begged for one last favour, because the night of Norse Galan was approaching, that's the old Welsh Halloween, when magic is more potent than any other night. And on that night, the salmon weir across the estuary was filled, without fail, every year, with silver glittering salmon. And Elfin thought, if I could just have that salmon, I could make a fresh start. And so he begged his father for this last favour, and his father agreed. So Elfin went down to the weir, and he watched, and he waited, while the tide rose up and then fell back down. And he couldn't believe it. The weir was empty. Or was it? There was something stuck in the middle of it. Some sort of dark black bundle. So Elfin clambered over to it and pulled it out. And then he heard a voice coming from the bundle. And it said, I am Taliesin. Elfin started to unwrap the bundle and then he saw a tiny baby lying there. He said, can you speak? I knew so little. And the baby said, I am more qualified to speak than you are to ask questions, Elfin. Take me back to your court. I am the answer to all your troubles. Elfin didn't know what to think. He took the basket and he tied it onto the back of his horse and he made his way back to his court. And as he rode, the baby recited poetry to him. Strange poetry, the like of which he hadn't heard before. Nidovamathad panam digonad am krey am kreyad o naurith savanid Ofroith, ofroitha, ofroith diw dechre, o vriallu a blod e bre, o pryd, o prydre. Not of mother and father was I made, but of nine elements, of the fruit of fruits, of the fruit of God at the beginning, of primroses and flowers of the hill, of the waters of the ninth wave, of the flowers of nettles, the blooms of woods and trees, of the essence of earth. And that baby... The baby, Taliesin, grew up to become the chief bard of the island of Britain and the greatest poet ever to write in the Brythonic language that we call Welsh. And they say that he put his divine knowledge into his words, into his poems and his stories, and when he spoke, his words went into people's hearts, they remembered them, and the words went from mouth to ear to mouth to ear, until... The shifting mists of time twisted those words and people weren't sure what they meant anymore. And maybe 500 years after Taliesin was born, a monk sits in a cell. He has two bottles of ink in front of him, one red, one black, two quill feather pens, one for each colour. And while a candle drips its wax into a holder, a storyteller stands at the shoulder of the monk and he recites the words that have come down to him, the words that Taliesin once spoke about a battle of trees, and the monk scratches them into the parchment. Beam and see our shrief, kinvim discovered. 
bin deigr yn awr, bin serwal sir, bin gair yn llythyr, bin llyfr yn prif der. I have been in many forms. I have been the brightness of stars, a word in a book. I was a path, an eagle, a coracle on the sea. Bin tant yn telyn, lla trithaw naw flwyddyn, yn dwfer yn ewyn, bin ysbwg yn tân, bin gwydd yn gwartha. I was a string in a harp, under enchantment for nine years. I was a spark in a fire. I was a tree in battle. And then silence fell, and it was as if the forest was watching him. A flash of white, the snap of a twig, and something was moving, something white. And my friend couldn't see what it was, but he dug his heels in and he gave chase. <laughs> something coming through the forest. 
raking the twigs and the trees in its path, getting closer and closer, and then he heard a strange otherworldly howling. And then as he watched, a pack of hunting dogs burst into the clearing, and they were like no other dogs that a mython had seen. Their bodies glittered white like new fallen snow, and as white as their bodies glittered, their ears glittered red like blood. They were lean and muscular and they glistened with sweat and the lead dog leapt in the air with its teeth bared and just as it was about to strike the deer, the deer vanished. The dog hit the ground and the dog vanished too and the whole pack of hunting dogs disappeared into the earth in front of a mython's eyes. A mython turned for home. And in the days and weeks that followed, he kept thinking about those animals that he'd seen. They were the most beautiful animals he'd ever seen. Imagine, he thought, imagine if I could have a pack of dogs like that to hunt with. Imagine if I could have a deer like that to loose in my forest so that I could hunt it. And then he thought, why shouldn't I have them? Am I not a chief? And the more he thought, the more he wanted those animals. And so he called his brother Gwydion. Now Gwydion was a magician. People weren't sure where he lived or what he did with his time, but people said, that he slept in the caves with mermaids, in the nests with birds. That he would stay a night here and there in exchange for helping a cow give more milk, sending away an evil spirit. And when Gwydion heard what a mycon had seen, he smiled his strange, twisted smile, and he said, The light half of the year will soon be over. And the dark half will begin. And the night that falls between those two halves of the year, that is Norse Galan. And on that night, the boundaries between the worlds are thinnest. You have found a place where the boundaries already crumble. Those animals that you saw were not of this world. Forget them. And my son said, you don't understand. How can I forget them? They're inside my head. Quidion said, I cannot help you. He turned and he walked out. And Mython was furious. He went out to the stable. He grabbed a length of rope and threw it over one shoulder. And he grabbed a sack and threw it over the other shoulder. And he rode. <laughs> He rode over hills and through valleys till he came to the forest, and then he waited. And I can't tell you if he waited days or weeks or months, but there he waited until he saw the flash of white again, and he gave chase. and as that pack of dogs burst into the clearing, as the lead dog jumped into the air, a mython opened the sack, the dog jumped straight in, a mython closed the sack, threw it over his shoulder, and headed for home. And when he got home, he called a feast. He called for the tables to be filled with the best of everything that could be had. There was food and drink for days and nights. There were musicians, and every now and then a mython would take one of his trusted friends aside. He'd take them outside into the courtyard to admire the animals, the animals that he had stolen from Anon. 
from the other world. The animals whose glittering white coats were just beginning to fade. And if you were to go through the mists and into Anun, you would see a landscape peppered with trees, all of them white, twisted and dead, and shreds of mist drifting between the trees and riding through the mist, a rider with a message. A message from our own King of Anun, a message for a mython. And if you want to hear what happens next, come back after the break. generosity of people like you and the, the American people have been very generous to me so far so uh, so thank you in advance <laughs> we'll pick a until he saw the flash of white again and he gave chase Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> do, do, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> 